Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, so my name is Sophie. I'm from the Effective Business and Engagement Team of Axford, and I'm here to introduce uh, my colleague, Dr. Philippa Smiles, who will be taking the webinar in just one week. Um, now, the webinar today is on the Research for Development Impact Network and an introduction. It will probably take um, about 30 minutes, and we thank you for joining. We are going to record the webinar, so it will be online um, on YouTube, our active YouTube channel, um, for everyone to have a look at at their own leisure afterwards. Um, in terms of questions, happy to take questions. Um, maybe just type them in as you go or wait to the end. It's up to you, and I'm sure Philippa will do her best to answer them if you have any. Um, also, uh, if you have any troubleshooting, if you can't hear me or you can't see any screens, um, please just type in your problem and we'll do our best to um, troubleshoot for you. Um, also, if you could uh, stay on your screen just at the very end, then we'll just loop straight into um, a very, very two-minute, quick two-minute um, survey just to uh, help us improve and understand our strengths and, and weaknesses in terms of um, event delivery and our learning um, suite of tools. Um, so maybe just before I introduce Philippa, could you could someone type in for me if they can hear me well, or you can see the opening screen. I can see Michael's typing. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that feedback. No, no further ado, here is Dr. Philippa Smiles. Thank you. All right. So, hello, everybody. Um, uh, do just let us know if uh, you stop being able to hear me clearly or if uh, there's other kinds of technical issues, but otherwise, I will launch into this. So, there's a few reasons why we wanted to do this webinar today. Um, firstly, I wanted to introduce the RDI network for those of you who are not so familiar with us, um, and also talk about how you can be involved uh, in our work and in the network. Secondly, I wanted to introduce the importance of ethical research and evaluation, and why it's particularly important for those of us in this sector. Uh, thirdly, I wanted to introduce the principles and guidelines for ethical research and evaluation and development and some of the work the network has been doing around ethical research and evaluation. And thirdly, I wanted to introduce the Ethical Starter Kit and the ability to use tools and resources that are translatable across research areas and cross cultural context. So that's all the things we're going to do today. So, a little bit of an intro into the Research for Development Impact Network. So, by way of a brief background, for those of you who are not familiar, we are basically a network of practitioners, researchers, evaluators, all sorts of people working in international development and global social justice. We started way back in about 2009, although that's more formally. Before that, informally, we existed for quite a while. Uh, we're currently growing to reaching over 1,600 individuals that are working across NGOs, universities, the government, and also some people in the private sector um, and consultants, etc. Uh, we used to be just a network of Australian-based researchers, evaluators, and practitioners, but uh, now we basically have anybody who would like to be in the network, they can be part of us. So the network exists to lead, stimulate and support effective ethical development research practice, also cross-sectoral partnerships and linkages, and uptake and use of evidence in policy and in practice. So we function as a cross-sector network. We exist to support and build upon the diverse experience and knowledge of our membership. We do not conduct research ourselves, uh, but what we do is support the process behind the gathering of evidence for better development outcomes. We also work in close partnership with ACFID and the ACFID membership in everything we do. 
and we're also generously supported by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. So the network is led by a voluntary steering committee of passionate and experienced individuals from within the ACFID membership, spanning the spectrum of academia and practice. So we actually have half of our uh, committee members from ACFID University, uh, ACFID, sorry, affiliate member universities, and then half are from uh, ACFID uh, NGOs. And it's also supported by a small secretariat. So we have Jenny, who is based in Sydney um, and works with a lot of the Sydney-based members, and myself, who is based here in Canberra and goes back and forth between all sorts of places. All right, can everyone still hear me? If you can't, let me know. So the next slide is uh, basically straight off our website. So you can see this is the RDI website and this is kind of what it looks like. Uh, so there's a lot of information on there about who we are, what we do under the About Us. Um, and also in the news section, we have a lot of uh, little reports about things that we're up to to keep everybody informed on what the network is doing uh, and some different things that are going on within the network, different events being held by different organisations and uh, people who are involved in the network. We also have an events page, so there's a lot of past events there as well as upcoming events that are coming up, so you can see what we're up to at the moment. Uh, and then you also see there's a learning hub, which some of the information that I refer to today is available there in the learning hub. Uh, and then find an expert and also some uh, information on our past conferences. Some of you may have heard about some of our past conferences. They used to be called the Acquid University Network Conferences, um, but uh, they've now been rebranded to the RDI Network Conferences. So if you want to, con to connect up to the committee, you can see that there is uh, highlighted up the top there in yellow, the Get Connected button. Uh, so if you push on that um, on the website, then it will lead you to a page where you can become either a standard member or an expert member. So a standard membership is basically um, allows you to access expertise in your field of interest, engage and contribute to the RDI initiatives and events, uh, to be kept informed of the latest research, for development news, events and opportunities through our monthly newsletter. Um, the monthly newsletter is quite popular because it does uh, tell everyone about what's going on in the sector if you want to be involved. Uh, the other option is to be an expert member. So being an expert member basically means you get all these benefits, but you can also fill in a profile for the find an expert search function. So basically under this find an expert, you can search for anybody who may be working in an area that you want to know more about, someone you might want to partner with or collaborate or just ask some questions, uh, and you can find them through the by the next batch. And if you find, if you sign up as an expert, that means you can put in your own profile and then people can contact you. Um, both types of memberships are free, so you don't have to pay anything to belong to the RDI network, and as I said, pretty much anybody can join. Uh, the other thing is that, of course, is uh, why we set up the by the expert is because DFAT sometimes tries to find experts overseas instead of using the expertise that we have here in Australia. And we all know that there's amazing expertise here, right here in Australia, uh, with people who know about what's going on in the Pacific or Asia, and even some people who know about what's happening in Africa. We have a lot of specialists in, in water and sanitation and gender and all sorts of things. You may not think of yourself as an expert, but you probably are. Um, you might be the only one who really knows that much about a particular area. So, for example, you might be the only one who knows about sanitation in Vanuatu, or you might be a, a really good monitoring evaluation specialist on monitoring evaluation uh, programs that involve the gender aspect, for example. So, we're all experts in some area. So, that's how you can get connected. Next one. So, some context. Uh, so we've been involved basically in working in ethical research for quite a while. Uh, it's always been a, a main sort of focus of the RTI network. Uh, and this has come about because of 
the membership that uh, this is what they, they wanted, is they wanted some more support around how to do ethical evaluation and research because uh, those of us working in international development are obviously working in quite uh, different contexts and sometimes with quite vulnerable people uh, and there's different power dynamics involved and so we wanted to make sure when we did any sort of research evaluation that it's done in the right way. So back in 2013, the principles for ethical research and evaluation uh, were finalised and those were endorsed by the ACFID Executive Committee, uh, which it was called back then, not anymore, after being written in consultation with the sector to ensure their applicability and usefulness. So the principles are based on and extend existing international recognised ethical principles, ethical research principles, and guidance for data collection with human participants. So the background is including the Australian Code for Responsible Conduct of Research, the National Statement on Ethical Conduct and Human Research, uh, the Values and Ethics Guidelines for Ethical Conduct in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Research. All of these documents were uh, looked at very carefully in building the principles. And um, those documents specify the standards expected in responsible conduct of research in Australia. But they're also aligned with the international agreements such as the Declaration Heritage and the International Human Rights Instruments. So beyond this source, this document also draws on literature on ethics and cross-cultural research, additional codes for evaluation ethics guidelines for research or evaluation developed by Australian aid and development non-governmental agencies working in developing countries. Uh, so there's also a bit of a focus on understanding the development imperatives within research practice conducted with and through NGOs. The principles provided in the document are aligned to inform all stages of the research process, including commissioning, design, planning, implementation, analysis, dissemination, and also use. So, uh, According to uh, the National Statement on human, um, Ethical Conduct and Human Research, uh, which was devised by the National Health and Medical Research uh, Committee, there is um, a need to use ethics committees for high-risk research. So uh, back in 2014, the network then did a, doing a mock ethics review uh, facilitated by the Institute of Sustainable Futures, and this was held in Melbourne, to look at maybe how we could do our own ethical review or have our own ethics review committee um, outside of the university ethics committee. Uh, and some work was done around that. Uh, also in 2014, they started looking at doing some guidelines to extend upon the principles of ethical research and evaluation. The guidelines were eventually published in 2015 uh, as an applied tool to support ethical research and theory and practice and draw from the principles and obligations of the Code of Conduct. In 2016, the complete principles and guidelines were published as one document uh, and then updated in July 2017 to align with the new Ackford Code of Conduct when that came into force. The principles and guidelines complement and extended the code in relation to research and evaluation practice by drawing on relevant national and international standards applicable to this area of work. So 2017, we went out to last year, we developed a suite of tools, templates and resources called the Starter Kit that individuals and organisations can use to apply the principles and guidelines. And in 2017, a workshop module, tools and resources were developed to socialise the principles and guidelines and all those were launched on the website for available use uh, of anybody free. So, all of these resources are designed to get it to inform or combine with the existing approaches that uh, people have in their current workplaces. Um, we know that uh, a lot of uh, organisations in Australia do already have some strong ethical practice methods, tools, resources, um, policies, and they also have a little uh, review panel set up within their own organisation. So this is really to draw on that best practice and to uh, to give resources to those uh, who do not have those resources within their organisation, especially really small NGOs uh, and CSOs that don't have that kind of uh, information available to them. So uh, we also, of course, draw, draw on the network itself 
and setting up the starter kit um, and other resources because there is a lot of information and tools already out there. So you'll see uh, if you go to the online starter kit, some of these organisations are acknowledged for providing their tools for assisting building the tools with us. Okay, so why is evaluation part of research? Some of you may have picked up that I quite often say research and evaluation. Uh, and the principles and guidelines are for research and evaluation. So why? Research is an original investigation undertaken to gain knowledge, understanding and insight, whereas evaluation is a systematic objective assessment of an ongoing or completed project, program or policy. But uh, what we hear is that a lot of CSOs and NGOs say they don't do research, um, but they do. They will do some form of evaluation at the very least. Evaluation is defined here as an investigation is undertaken systematically to gain that knowledge and insight into the success and impact of programs. It also shares the same links to policy and program and the associated heightened risk of power imbalances as other types of research. So if you can see there on the diagram, many evaluations present ethical issues, some serious risk of harm to participants. Evaluations also have strong ethical implications as they are often connected with policy and programming decisions that affect the lives of either participants or other populations. So this increases the power differentials between the evaluator and the participant. Evaluations also operate in excess of multiple stakeholder interests. These interests exert influence on the evaluation program process, which in turn may constrain or reduce the priority given to participant perspectives. There's also no current broadly adopted framework that governs the quality of evaluations in our sector. Evaluation is considered and included in the principles and guidelines as a type of applied research. So from here on, the term research will be used to encompass both research and evaluation, and researchers will also encompass evaluators. So, why is it important for us to do? Why do we need to do ethical research and evaluation? Well, the definition of ethics is that uh, moral principles that govern the person's behaviour or the conducting of the activity, um, but that's not really very helpful. So research is conducted in developing countries, in particular in relation to international development. Um, it raises distinct ethical, moral and political dilemmas. These often arise due to current and historical disparities in wealth our access to information, political interests, the status of researchers and participants. Adopting and adhering to ethical research principles might at first appear overwhelming, confusing, time-consuming, or an already time and resource-limited sector. But ethical research conducted by development organisations can also provide expert knowledge to inform practice, policy and discourse across the Australian development sector and, of course, more broadly. Ethical practice is a key theme among the across the principles of the Act Code of Conduct. Here on the diagram are four additional reasons why ethical research by international organisations is important for both the sector and for beyond. Development organisations doing ethical research are best placed to produce systematic participatory research from the ground up to, to inform policy and practice alongside academia. They're also best placed to accelerate and apply the use of research findings to translate them into programming and to advocacy. Best placed to improve the quality, accountability and impact of the organisation's program and the sector. And finally, best placed to identify issues of humanitarian and development need that require research and to take an active role in facilitating that research. Uh, there is a lot of... There are a lot of uh, situations where doing ethical research is really important and where ethical considerations will arise. So um, I was involved in the trial of these workshops and, and doing it with uh, a couple of people in a trial run and uh, a lot of different examples of uh, ethical conflict came up. Uh, and I myself have also been involved in situations overseas doing research or doing an evaluation of a program where an ethical problem has arisen. Uh, so a bit of an example, um, you might be uh, interviewing a couple of people during a bit of a focus group um, discussion to evaluate a particular program. 
you will be uh, done all your um, consent progress process with, with the people. So they'll consent you, they know why they're in the room, uh, they know what you're maybe going to talk to you about, they know that they're free to, to leave any time. Um, and you've just gotten into the process of actually asking them questions that you want answers to, uh, and then someone else walks into the room. And you think, oh, okay, right, do I stop here? Do I ask the person to fill in a form and tell them, you know, what we're doing here and go through that full process all over the game with the extra person? Do I ask them to leave the room um, or do I just carry on? <laughs> and this happens, you know. Um, another example I can think of is when you were speaking to a person um, about a project or, or something that you uh, are doing in a country and you're having a chat with them about uh, why you want to do this particular project or an evaluating project um, and uh, they start crying and telling you some quite uh, horrific things um, that has been happening to them and why they need your assistance in that community. And again, you know, what do I do here? Um, you know, these sorts of situations occur all the time. Uh, procedures and instructions that you may have been given in advance may not be useful in these situations. You may have to still make a split-second decision at that point in time. Uh, uh, sometimes these instructions and procedures may also not translate well very much you're in the field in a different cultural context. There can be differences between following guidelines and protocols to letter, and what actually happens when researchers are working in the field in the international development setting. Acting ethically also means responding to unexpected circumstances in a way that both aligns with guidelines and protocols, but above all, upholds the principles themselves, even if this means not strictly adhering to the protocols that become contextually irrelevant. So the aim of the starter kit um, is to encourage NGO practitioners working in international development to incorporate a cultural, a cultural ethical inquiry into their research and evaluation practice. So what is a culture of ethical inquiry? Well, it means that instead of being ethics and a set of rules or regulations or a paperwork trial or forms, more forms to fill in, NGO practitioners are instead encouraged to think both critically and reflectively about possible ethical issues and challenges that may arise during their research and evaluation work and how they might respond to those. So much of international development work relies upon strong and trusting relationships between development practitioners, local partners and community. As such, ethical issues and challenges are often located in the space between NGO practitioners, their organisations, local partners, communities and other individuals involved in international development programmes. Ethical issues and challenges therefore differ from community to community and context to context. This is why there is not a set of one-size-fits-all rules to follow. Instead, NGO practitioners need to develop a strong sense of self-awareness and reflective thinking to be able to negotiate each ethical challenge and dilemma that emerges from these multiple contexts in a way that is relevant and also appropriate. A culture of ethical inquiry means that practitioners consider the following two guiding questions at all time. What does ethical practice look like in this specific international development context? What steps do I, or we, need to take to ensure our research and evaluation work is done ethically? And this is involving all staff, so not necessarily just yourself, or just the Australians, or just the Australian NGO, but also your partners, also anyone else who does any research or evaluation for you. The principles and guidelines, as well as the ethical practice workshop and the starter kit, do not give all the answers, uh, and nor just the active code of conduct. What they do is assist and encourage staff and organisations in a culture of ethical inquiry. Right, so at this point uh, we do have an animation. Um, we've had a few technical difficulties in getting uh, to be able to show this to you directly. So what I'm going to ask you to do is if you can see uh, under the uh, little comment section, you can see there is a YouTube link. So if you want to just go ahead and click on that, you should click, click that link and have a look at the uh, little video. It's about three and a half minutes long. So if you can have a look at that now and then just type a message to me when you've finished having a look at that and then we can continue on.
All right, welcome back. Hopefully everybody has finished watching that short little animation. Uh, so we did that because the best of the guidelines contain a lot of concepts that we can be quite complex to understand the abstract, uh, as well as a lot of jargon language. Um, so this, is, this can be really uh, inhibiting for in-country officers and research partners overseas who don't have the same degree of English fluency as Australian-based staff. Uh, so that's why we did the animation, and it is on our website as well, um, or I can uh, get it to you if you would like to have your own copy of that. Um, we did want to put subtitles in it, but then it's like, you know, what language do you put subtitles in? So at the moment, it, it, um, it's just in English. So a bit of a recap. So respect is the overarching principle and represents recognition of each human being's intrinsic value. Beneficence is an action that is done for the benefit of others. The expected benefit to participants or the wider community justifies any risk of harm or discomfort to the participant. So what you hope is that what you're doing the research for is not just for yourself, but also to make sure that the work you're doing is done better. Research deemed to have merit is well justified, it meets relevant quality criteria, and is conducted by persons of teams with sufficient expertise and competence. So you don't want to send someone off to do the research who is not fully really prepared uh, to be able to do that research the best um, that they can. Research integrity is secured by research and research fund or commissioner. Commitment to genuine search for knowledge and understanding. Why are you doing the research? Are you doing the research for the right reason? And are you doing it the right way, of course, as well? So justice is generally described in relation to equity. A fair process for recruitment of research participants. No unfair burden of participation on particular groups. And fair distribution of and access to the benefits of participation in research. So that's about making sure that you don't uh, overburden anyone in particular and you keep asking them too many questions. Um, but also making sure that you actually ask the right people questions. So have you got uh, enough women in the group if you're doing um, interviews with people? Are you, have you got someone there with a disability perhaps? So if, if, um, if, that's, uh, if that's good practice for what you're doing. Or um, just making sure that if you're asking for information from a community that there is people from across the community answering questions, not just the people in charge, perhaps. So I'm not going to go into every single principle because that would take quite a long time. Uh, but what I am going to do is just go into one in particular um, and just give a little bit more detail on that one. All right, so just check in, anyone can still hear me? If not, please let us know. Okay, so the first principle is about respect for human beings. In practice, this principle can be broken down into three different concepts. Um, but respect is your overarching consideration, and represents recognition of every human being's intrinsic value. As such, making opportunity for human beings to exercise autonomy and make their own decisions is paramount as is a commitment to participant welfare over and above the research goals. So respect requires prior knowledge of and due regard for culture, values, customs, beliefs, and practices, both those of the individual and of the collective of those involved in the research. It also requires mindfulness of differences in value and culture between the researchers and the participants thus avoiding difference blindness, which can undermine both trustful relationships as well as research integrity. Respect involves honouring the rights, privacy, dignity, entitlement, and diversity of those contributing to the research. So the four principles, uh, sorry, three principles that we talk about the most are informed consent, that research participants choose to participate with full knowledge of the research and their involvement in it, and this decision is conveyed to the researcher and can change at any time. Cultural competence, the researchers are well informed, capable and confident of ensuring the research environment is safe, comfortable and culturally appropriate. And then privacy and confidentiality. The rights and dignity of the research participants are respected at all times, including privacy and confidentiality, before, during and after the research takes place. 
So to have a look at it a bit more at informed consent. Uh, this is something that usually comes up first and foremost. It's something that uh, we get the most questions about, um, and this is something that the uh, workshop goes into in quite a lot of detail. So informed consent is fundamental to upholding the principle of respect and giving research participants the choice to voluntarily participate in the research process. Informed consent means that the participant is giving them clear information about the research, is able to choose not to participate, and is able to withdraw at any time without consequence. And if there is any limit to that right, it needs to be explained to all participants in advance. Informed consent is one of the basic minimum requirements for the research. It's also the one we get a lot of questions on, as I just said. So the most important part of conformed consent is that participants are able to choose to participate or not to participate based on the information that they've received. Participants must also know their conducive withdrawal and be comfortable to indicate this to the researcher, which is another thing entirely. Not every conversation with research participants, of course, needs to involve consent, and this is something we also get questions on. A good way of determining when consent is needed is if the conversation is part, part of a systematic process of collecting information. So it's not just a conversation about the weather or you know other things, but you actually are using it to collect data. So there are a couple of different ways of obtaining informed consent. Uh, most of you, of course, will know about the written consent. There's the most formal method. It requires participants to have an adequate level of literacy and also the information may need to be translated for this. Written consent usually involves a participant information statement and a formal consent form, which is signed by the research participants and or the guardian if that is required. So um, the CDI has the tools A, B and C that refers to our website, the starter kit. It gives you a couple of example tools that you can use to get written consent. Uh, the second way is through verbal consent. That may be most appropriate where participants have low literacy levels, or where full of formal approaches may not be appropriate. It's best practice for the researcher to have a written record that informed consent was given, either verbally, uh, either, sorry, was given verbally, including the date, location, and any witnesses that can verify that that took place. So we also have an example tool for that. Finally, there is activity-based consent. This is one that's not really talked about quite a lot, but it may be most appropriate where participants are, for example, children. So what you can do is children can be asked a series of simple questions about the research and how they feel about participating in it. A child then can choose an image that best represents their feelings about the question. So, for example, a smiley face or a sad face. And we have a tool E that looks at that. So, the second principle that I want to look at is cultural competence. Researchers working in international development are frequently working in contact with the cultural background of local research partners and research participants, and be very different from their own. Understanding cultural and cultural difference is complex and requires time and experience. However, researchers can begin building cross-cultural competency by developing their ability to reflect on their own cultural values their identity differences with the research participants and to accommodate these respectively. Researchers can also prepare for cross-cultural interaction by ensuring they have a thorough understanding of the cultural values of the research setting uh, so they can speak to talk people in advance to find out about the cultural values of where they're headed or where they're going to be doing their research. Uh, tool F on the website contains 10 common examples of cultural values and practices that relate to research. And each of these topics, a series of questions for the researcher to consider prior to connecting the research. If local research partners are involved, they may be the most reliable source of information and advice of what to do and what not to do. And then another component is research and respecting rights through privacy and confidentiality. Uh, so, respecting the rights of research participants is a responsibility that researchers must uphold at all times. Research can and often does involve asking participants questions about their lives and livelihoods. Respecting participants' privacy means accepting the amount of information persons are willing, willing to share and entrust with the researcher. 
and sharing this information to the researcher and trusting sorry, this information to the researcher also carries with it an obligation on the researcher to manage this information both carefully and confidentially. And confidentially. Some participants may be exposed to a significant risk of their decision to participate and the content of their participation is not kept confidential. If anonymity is re required, the researcher must ensure additional steps and techniques are undertaken to be identified participants during and after the research takes place. So researchers should give opportunities for participants to choose varying degrees of confidentiality from having absolutely no indicators uh, that could show who they are to different forms of identification such as by number, by an age or by sex or three. Data management or the management of information obtained during research is key to ensuring that your research remains confidential and if required, completely anonymous. So if you see here on the side, there is a little bit of a pictograph there. Um, it's showing a data management flowchart where researchers can plan how their data will be managed. This can also be used to communicate this plan with local research partners and also with participants. So you can see this data to get uh, for tool G, the data management flowchart. Um, I find it quite useful myself in doing that because sometimes you will get a lot of information and data through um, a research project or an evaluation in particular, and you have to think about how you're going to keep those different sources uh, confidential. So there might be some things on your laptop, there might be some things on a USB drive, you might have other things recorded on your cell phone as a voice recording. All these things you have to think about how you are going to keep them over time and to make sure that they are stored in a way that you can still access them, uh, but that it is keeping with the agreement that you've received from participants when you ask for their consent. All right, so we're pretty much at the end now, almost. A couple more slides to go. So um, I want to let you know the training module that we've developed, which expands upon the information I've begun to highlight today, the workshop that I've been talking about. It offers individuals the opportunity to go through the online version of the starter kit for free in their own time, um, as well as being able to, to get into it in more detail. So on the website you'll see we've got um, the principles and guidelines for the research and evaluation can be downloaded. We've also got a few different case studies that you can look at. Um, the starter kit itself, of course, which is, as I said, is free, and you can go in and out of it whenever you like. It's quite easy to navigate. Uh, and then, of course, the training module and further resources. We have some more information there. We offer organisations the opportunity to host in-house training. You can contact me on more information about that. Um, either you can purchase the full module and do it yourself, or you can purchase the module and one of our... Uh, extremely experienced facilitators can facilitate that for you. Um, and uh, you can also come along to our regularly hosted open workshops. So these workshops are a must do training opportunity. Anyone who commissions, conducts, or utilizes research and evaluation products that supports the application of the protocols. We went through two whole rounds of trial runs before this has been rolled out to the sector last year. Um, and they're facilitated by one of our very experienced ethical research trainers. So as you can see, there's some dates there for the ones coming up very soon. Uh, there's one in Melbourne and there's one in Sydney. So as I said, if you would like to um, do the workshop, you can contact me for more information. We may do it in other centres around Australia as well. Uh, so we're pleased also to say that this year we're offering the workshops free for staff and volunteers of active member NGOs in Category 5 to 9. Um, and also a very reasonable way for anybody else. You don't have to be an ACFID member to be able to come to the full day workshops. Uh, if you're interested, see the upcoming event page on our website. Uh, and that is pretty much it from me. There's a few details about our contact there. And of course, stay to fill out the survey at the end. But if anyone has any questions, I'm really happy to answer any. Um, otherwise, feel free to also send us an email as well. Any questions? Not any typing? All right. All right. Oh, I have one question. <laughs> oh, no, it's just a thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, that's all right. Um, yeah, do let me know if you do have any questions there. As I said, I'm really happy to assist you um, because, of course, you are, uh, whether you are part of the network now or will be in the future. Um, I'd like to stay in contact with everybody. Uh, and, yes, yeah, uh, have a look through the website at start get in your own time or feel free to tell people about the website. Thank you very much for listening.